to their community building activity to the table. And I can't imagine a table that doesn't have all eight of those <laughs> around it and can't build, therefore, a kind of holistic idea about where we're going in this community. We're also then probably going to want to have some institutions around. We're going to want to have the schools there. We're going to want to have the police there. Talk about neighborhood safety. We're going to want to have the businesses themselves there. We're going to want to have uh, the parks and the libraries. But you see that the discussion needs to start and be centered and be driven by the citizens' voices. And that those institutional voices, those triangles, are so important to have there, but to have there as responsive sets of resources. The treasure chests, right? It's the circles that will open up the treasure chests and ask them to contribute to the community building process. So that's the kind of table we've got. Once you've got a table like that, it's time then to think about what can this table do, logically enough. Well, John, do you want to help us start thinking about what this table does? Right. It goes right to the map. <laughs> <laughs> and it begins the business of identifying all of the individual capacities, all of the associational assets, and all of the institutional assets so that its initial business is, is sort of mining the territory, is making sure of every asset that is there. And as that happens, right, it will expand the table because they will find more and more associations. And it will probably expand the institutional table. So this will build the, build the table. Secondly, it will make clear that where we're focused is on assets and not needs and deficits so that everybody at the table will have that experience. And finally, and we think this is really very important, that when the table, the associations, the people who are involved in community planning are doing an asset inventory, if at all possible, they should do it themselves. They should not have some outsider do it because every time you go door to door and you ask your neighbor about their skills or their entrepreneurial experience, every time you go and try to talk with the leaders of other associations, you're building a relationship, a new kind of relationship. You're not going and saying to somebody, I wonder if you can't read. <laughs> you're not asking them negative questions. You're asking them affirmative questions. And so you build a community's relationships by this kind of inventory of assets if the key people who are sitting at the table are directly involved and their associations are involved as well. And so that leads us to the third point. Which is simply, I think, something that lots of you in the audience, I'll bet, have had some experience with, and it is to build a vision. Without a vision, the people perish. Where is that in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. right? It's clear that the community that has come together at the table with the broadest representation possible and built together their sense of where we want to be in 2010, how can I imagine this community for my children and my grandchildren? What do we want? Not just a physical sense, not just a, not just a sense of what we want it to look like, but what, what kind of social relations do we want here? What are we talking about in terms of an economy? What is our vision together? And people who have worked hard at that, or there are all kinds of techniques for doing it that we won't go into tonight, know that that vision can drive a process and can keep people coming back to the table on a positive note, not, not just because they want to stop something, but because now we know. Now we know what we believe in and where we're going. Once we have a vision then, John, and the table set, what do we do next? Well, next we take the fourth step. And if this is where the vision would lead us, and this is where we are now. What we have seen as the critical process now is that all the associations come together and they say each, what can we do to make that vision come real? What can the softball league do to raise money for our plan for the parks that we are going to create in the community? What can the softball league do to bring in, begin to bring young people in to be connected and, and engaged with adults? And what will, uh, what will the softball league do to maintain the land and clear it when we're, when we're done? So what happens is when you add up all of the contributions of the associations is you find you've gotten this far. And then 
you realize that you have your institutions, right? And they are all treasure chests. So you go and you check out each treasure chest and say, what is the institution going to do to get us to our vision? What is the school going to contribute? What is the hospital going to contribute? What is the community college going to contribute? And we know that what you will find is that when you take the associational assets and the institutional assets and you add them up, you're almost there, but you won't be there. Because now you're to the fifth point, and that is you're going to have to get something from outside. Right? And Dudley Street has been a wonderful example of what happens when you, when you really mobilize and commit your local associations and institutions. Then you'll know what you need to get to your goal. And what they know they needed was control over their land. They had a wonderful plan, but they didn't control the land. It was owned by slum landlords, and some of it was in courts, and the city had some. So they persuaded the city of Boston to give them the power of eminent domain. And that made their vision a possible reality. So that's the way we think that you can take the fourth and the fifth step. John, as long as you're mentioning the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, we just want to say that if you want to really look at this process of a powerful neighborhood planning effort, that, that looking at the book called Streets of Hope, The Fall and Rise of an Urban Neighborhood by Peter Medoff and Holly <laughs> Sklar um, is one way to really get a sense of the Dudley Street story. That's the story of the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, and it's a wonderful read for anybody who's interested in community building. Um, I wish we had the time to tell that full story, but read the book. <laughs> but the story we do want to leave you with in this section, um, how does all this stuff work out in a single place? We've got a little clip we'd, we'd like you to, to look at from a, from a uh, city called Monroe, Louisiana, where uh, folks who, in fact, had never talked with each other for hundreds of years got together in a kind of powerful community planning process that excited us and from which we learned an awful lot. It happened to be the process that was called for by the legislation <coughs> that enacted the empowerment zone. So here is a story from Monroe, Louisiana, about how their citizens got together to do a neighborhood plan. Washita Parish, a small community in northeast Louisiana yet the largest urban area in the impoverished Mississippi Delta. To some, this may appear to be just an old abandoned building on Monroe's south side. To others, it's a vision of hope. Some may think of her as just a disadvantaged youth growing up in a single parent household. She imagines herself as a college graduate. Poverty and other social ills threaten the economic growth of a community and can destroy the dreams of those who live among them. In Washita Parish, with a population of 142,000, some 40,000 people live in poverty. According to the last census, Monroe is ranked as the third poorest city in the nation with a poverty rate of 37.8%, more than twice the national rate. These staggering statistics made community and business leaders and government officials from Washita Parish, Monroe, and West Monroe realize that a change needed to occur. They looked beyond the numbers and saw the community itself, the people living there, their hopes, and their dreams. Together, these leaders and residents can empower each other to use all their resources to reclaim their community, their goals, their dreams. They began to come together in the neighborhoods. Approximately 600 residents attending 11 neighborhood meetings identified their strengths and their greatest ambitions for their community. We're working together and we're actually motivated from the inside. It's not something that we're doing because we have to do it. We're doing it because we want to and that's the difference that makes the difference. This process has is, is introduced us to more people, a, a more diverse group of people. There's a lot of energy and I don't think it's do anything but just explode and, and be better for us. Business leaders, along with neighborhood residents, assembled at Northeast Louisiana University's Ewing Coliseum to develop a vision for Washita Parish. This was part of the strategic planning process, which forged new partnerships. Almost 400 people 
black, white, employed, unemployed, young and old, visualized our community in the year 2004. The wisdom of age, the vigor of youth, and the knowledge of the learned helped to reduce hundreds of ideas to nine targeted cluster areas. Building safe and caring neighborhoods, creating quality, diverse jobs, developing market-driven education, expanding community-based business ownership by zone residents, creating innovative and accessible wellness systems, improving home ownership opportunities, improving and coordinating transportation and communication infrastructure, improving the physical community condition, and developing the downtown and river area for tourism. I think what we saw today was an historic event for Monroe. We brought blacks and whites together. We brought old and young. We brought Christians and Muslims and Jews. And, uh, we brought uh, unemployed people, we brought employed people, we brought people who have more than one job to support their family. We brought, peop uh, brought people who don't have jobs who support their family together today to come and, and reach a common vision of what Washita Parish is all about for the future. We've never done that in this community. This community is hundreds of years of, uh, old, and this is uh, something that I think will carry us forward for hundreds of more years, but it's uh, certainly in the next decade, and we have a lot of work to do. We've learned that we're friends. And I think that's the most valuable asset here. They, uh, the railroad track doesn't have to be a dividing line, just a passageway to get from one neighborhood to, to the other. Citizens met for several weeks to carve out the strategies for achieving the vision of these nine areas. 27 projects emerged as the basis for the community's strategic plan. The vision becomes more potent with the commitments of not only the residents, but the business community and the three neighboring institutions of higher learning. Northeast Louisiana University, bordering the zone, as well as sister universities, Grambling State and Louisiana Tech, have come together in an unprecedented joint effort. The strength of our vision will truly lie with the people of the neighborhoods, working together with business, human service, and government leaders to build a stronger community. That's why thousands of people put in writing their commitment to make this community a better place. They signed the Washita Pact, stating their volunteer community service. Their crusade became known as Back the Pact. I want to regain the strength of our community and provide positive outlets for our youth. That's why I back the pact. Seeing businesses expand to create more jobs. That's why I back the pact. More minorities to own their own businesses. That is the reason why I back the pact. What does it mean, back the pact? That's your written promise to help improve this community. Whether it's tutoring at-risk children, planting a flower bed, providing more jobs. Support this community. Back to back. This is a community that has learned to build on its strengths. The enormous investment of thousands of citizens in Washita Parish has forged new relationships and means our community will never be the same. Change is gradual, but change is constant. What the people of Washita Parish have discovered is change is empowering. So there we have one incredibly exciting story, it seems to me, of a community that has really uh, gotten into a kind of uh, a new life, if you will. I think there's an energy in Monroe that you feel there, that they've, in fact, mobilized all of their assets, and they really are. They got an enterprise community designation, and they're moving forward. Um, the idea of the Back the Pact uh, movement, it seems to me, is one that communities all over the country might uh, begin to adapt. What, it is, what is it that, that people could actually sign that says, here's what I'm going to contribute to my community over the next decade? It's a wonderful example that we've learned a lot from. From Maine to New Mexico, Arkansas to Oregon, Civic Network Television is lighting up America. CNT, linking America's communities to each other and the future. Live from Washington, D.C., Civic Network Television brings you Mobilizing Community Assets. And now, our moderator, Ramona Edelin. Jody, would you begin the final module, Challenges of Outside Help? Well, there's a reason why we've kept this till last, Ramona. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's partly because these are difficult questions. These questions of how is it that funders and governments and universities and large businesses who really do want to see communities built, 
who want to see economies revived, who want to see people's hope once again uh, being built upon. Um, too often, our